Hello and good morning. Welcome to our briefing, What Congress Needs to Know About Corporate Climate Risk, Resilience, and Disclosures. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to utilities in rural areas interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always free online at www.eesi.org. If you'd like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a moment to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It honestly feels like forever since our last briefing. It was all the way back on July 25th when we hosted the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. There's this insidious myth that August is somehow the quiet part of the year in Washington. Uh, and most of the days that have passed since our policy forum were in, uh, were in August, of course, but August was anything but slow this year. So tell that to the people who brought us the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and, and helped to keep all of us very, very busy. Everybody who works in climate policy spent uh, August very, very busy. Uh, we focused on uh, Inflation Reduction Act related news and, an and analysis in our latest issue of our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. If you're not subscribed, I really encourage you to do that. It's the best way to keep up with everything. And we've been producing a lot of really great resources about the IRA and all of the different programs and investments that it provides. There's a lot to like in the Inflation Reduction Act, but it also leaves a lot left to do. So here we are back to briefings to raise awareness and share information about all that remains to be done to meet our Paris Agreement goals and to do so in an equitable way. In addition to this briefing, uh, next week we will host a panel about climate action in K-12 schools. And then we'll ramp up our coverage of issues related to COP27, the UN climate negotiations. We will have four briefings about what Congress needs to know about COP27 in October, or as I like to call it, COPtober, about key findings from the sixth assessment report, natural climate solutions, loss and damage, and the negotiations themselves and what to expect. Last year, we'll also publish a Congress-oriented daily newsletter during COP27. I hope you'll visit us online at www.eesi.org to RSVP for the briefings and sign up for the newsletter. Our briefing today is all about what Congress needs to know about corporate climate risk, resilience, and disclosures. Climate change poses significant financial risks, such as increasingly frequent and severe weather that disrupts supply chains, destroys valuable infrastructure, and decreases labor productivity. To begin accounting for this risk, the Securities and Exchange Commission recently proposed a rule that would require publicly traded companies to disclose their climate-related risks and report their greenhouse gas emissions. We're currently in a period between the proposed rule and the next action by the SEC, which is currently working through the mountain of public comments on the proposed rule. While climate change is a very serious threat, there are also many opportunities for the private sector to shift towards cleaner energy and adapt to climate impacts that are already affecting companies of all sizes. But currently, a lack of clear, comparable, and consistent information on what risks companies face and how they contribute to the climate crisis is leaving investors and other stakeholders in the dark. The need for information remains critical yet elusive. And our panelists today will discuss corporate climate risk and disclosure from multiple perspectives and the benefits of a standardized approach to analyzing and understanding the effects of climate change on businesses. Let me remind everyone that we'll have some time at the end of our briefing for questions. And we'll do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us via email at ask at eesi.org. That's ASK at eesi.org. Or even better, follow us on Twitter at EESI Online and send it to us that way. We have a special guest today, and it's my privilege to introduce Representative Sean Kasten. As a scientist, clean energy entrepreneur, and executive, and now as a member of Congress, Representative Kasten has dedicated his life to fighting climate change. In Congress, Representative Kasten draws on his two decades of experience as a business leader to reduce emissions while creating jobs, lowering energy costs for Americans, and spurring economic growth. Representative Kasten serves on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, and is the Vice Chair of the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets. He also serves as co-chair of the New Democrat Coalition and Climate Change Task Force, 
and co-chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Coalition Power Sector Task Force. Thank you, Representative Kasten, for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Hello, Congressman Sean Kasten here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person as always, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about climate risk disclosure. We, of course, introduced the climate risk disclosure bill passed on the floor of the House. And then just like they say on Schoolhouse Rock, a bill becomes a law because the president signs an executive order and implements. Uh, that's a joke. Um, so, uh, but they're not doing that. The SEC, of course, their comment period has closed. And I can't comment on SEC rulemaking. I'm sure a lot of you are weighing in. But I think it's important to understand why we pushed for this and why the SEC is doing it and what we have to do next. Um, the one of the big reasons to pushing for this is that we need investor disclosure. The we have you know trillions of dollars of funds and ESG assets that increasingly can't define things in a consistent way. If you're investing in a geothermal plant and that geothermal plant is selling their electric output to an aluminum plant, and both of them are claiming to be zero carbon, if you invest in both, are you doubling your carbon impact? I mean, this isn't this is an objective question. But the SEC rules haven't clarified how we're going to go through and report that so that people who want to invest in cleaner assets know how to do that. And then you, of course, get layers of questions on top of there. How about if you if you own the equity but not the debt? What if you own the debt but not the equity? How does that get counted? And the SEC has got to, somebody has to define all that stuff. And, we're, you know, we're, we push to, uh, to do it legislatively and hoping that they'll push through. Going forward, though, there's really a bigger issue that once we get this data in, then we get to ask, the, the really critical questions of trying to understand where is the financial risk in our, in our capital markets from climate change? Where is capital flowing away from, either because it's running away from flooding or fires, or from industries that aren't going to be around? Where is it running to, the places that are building batteries, that are building wind turbines? We know that that money is moving in the financial system. We know that that rapid movement of capital has the ability to, to destabilize the financial system. And we know that our financial, re financial regulators so far really don't even have the data to track it. So we're hoping that with this SEC climate disclosure, we can start to get the data. We've got follow-on bills that we need to do in Congress to make sure that, uh, that our financial regulators, both domestically and internationally, start tracking those capital flows. And I hope you'll work with us because, because ultimately we're going to need you know, something like uh, GAP, FASB, for clean energy that comes up with these rules to make sure that, uh, that the United States continues to be a leader. Um, so thanks, I hope I've uh, triggered some thoughts and uh, look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. Thanks to Representative Kasten for joining us this morning and providing some introductory remarks and I always appreciate a schoolhouse uh, rock reference as well. So thanks very much for that. Uh, that is the perfect way to lead into our really incredible uh, panel this morning. Our first panelist is Madison Condon. Madison is an associate professor of law at Boston University. Her research has focused on the relationship between climate change and corporate governance, market risk, and regulation. Madison, really, really looking forward to your presentation today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I will share my presentation. Um, how's oh, my screen just went black. Can you see my slides? Can see, there it goes. Looks great. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Um, okay. So thank you so much for having me. I am going to try to do a pretty background um, explanation of where we are with climate financial risk oversight in the Biden administration in general. Um, there's really a lot going on. So in um, May 2021, Biden issued this executive order on climate related financial risk, which really gives all financial regulatory agencies a climate risk oversight mandate. Um, so some are farther along than others in their rulemaking proceedings, and notably the SEC has not only the climate disclosure rule, but two other rules in the works as well, which I will mention. And several agencies, in addition to the Federal Reserve, which is independent and so not uh, subject to this executive order, have joined this thing called the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is an, an international network that provides uh, recommended regulatory policies and different strategies for monitoring systemic risk that many central banks and financial regulatory <clears throat> groups across the world, mainly in Europe and in the UK, are beginning to adopt. So we are moving along with the rest of the world, finally. 
Um, and this, so this is just a quick, we're not going to go through this whole slide, but I thought this was a good overview just to show how many agencies beyond the SEC are engaging in some type of policy work or rulemaking in this arena. Um, I took this from Ceres, the investor um, policy group. So it's the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, you can see all these different groups are trying to figure out how to understand climate risk and how to then do actionable regulation around it. So as um, Representative Kasten mentioned, data is a really important fundamental first step to doing the rest of the steps. Um, and I'll just mention a few things that have happened this summer and outside of the SEC. So Treasury announced that there's going to be a climate data and analytics hub housed within the Office of Financial Research that will um, sort of build a giant data lake of all the climate risk of information that's available from the science agencies and from some private providers and public providers and be a resource. It, the plan is for it to be eventually be a resource across the financial regulatory agencies, including the Federal Reserve. And another development is that OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is the banking regulator, has a, a new Office of Climate Risk, and they hired a new um, climate risk oversight officer from the New York uh, Department of Financial Services, Dr. Nina Chen, and she's probably one of the most qualified people who's really been thinking about how to do climate risk oversight of the banking sector. So there's there's a lot of really exciting things happening across the federal government is, is what I want to flag. Um, so at the SEC in particular, we have three rules in the works. There's the climate related disclosures for investors. So that's from issuers, from corporates that are publicly traded in the market have to disclose their climate risk. There's also two rules that are aimed at funds themselves, at investors themselves. One is called the names rule, which sort of regulates how you brand and market your fund, your index fund or your ETF or your active fund. If you call it sustainable, like what does that mean? Um, and one is in, uh, sort of increased ESG disclosure rules for investment funds and advisors that claim to be ESG or use ESG data. I'm not going to spend very long on this slide because I think probably most of you are tuning in. You've, you're at least aware um, mostly of what's on this slide, but I would say traditionally climate risk in general is broken down into three subcategories. Physical risk, which is like, is your factory going to get hit by a hurricane or a flood? Transition risk, which is, are you over-invested in fossil, fossil intensive industries that are not prepared for the transition that are going to have stranded assets? You're going to be left holding a bunch of oil fields that aren't worth money, that have a bunch of cleanup costs, and liability risk, which is really on the rise, I would say. You know, there's an increasing number of lawsuits of many different types against um, fossil fuel producers growing in the courts internationally, but also in the U.S. And one thing I really do want to flag is that climate risk analytics Climate risk analysis in the financial se sector and physical risk in analytics in particular is like an exploding and huge business and has really been driving like a lot of mergers and acquisition activity in the financial services sector. So like Moody's and S&P are in sort of this like climate intelligence arms race trying to buy up catastrophic risk providers and ESG metrics. And there's really been like a ton of business of trying to assess these financial risks. So I flagged that just to say that what the SEC is doing is very much sort of like mirroring and standardizing what the industry has been doing and has been like on the mission to do for many years now. And it's been accelerating. Um, so the subject of greenwashing has been um, in the press a lot recently and there's you know there's different greenwashing concerns at different in different parts of the financial sector so what are concerns at the corporate level and you know how might disclosure address these rules so if you've made a net zero goal like are those goals achievable are they based on science do they over rely on unproven or unreli unreliable activities do you have some sort of tracking and monitoring system what if you bought a bunch of carbon offsets and the forest that you bought to offset your carbon has now burned down? That's a, this is an evolving space. Um, are the scope emissions that you report actually accurate? Are they audited? So this is one of the problems is that there's a there's an enormous, robust, voluntary carbon disclosure framework. 
And investors use this voluntarily disclosed information in like very key ways that affect the allocation of assets. You know, they use your scope three emissions data in how they build an index fund. And, you know, whether or not that data is real is a real question, is, is verified as a real question. And it's sort of a sketchy industry right now, even with, you know, some people can claim that their emission scores have been audited, but it's sort of what is what level of auditing do you really mean? So it's a little bit of the Wild West and the disclosure rule will really make it a little more um, rigorous. Are the emission scenarios used by the company from for assessing their transition risks reasonable? So companies have gotten in trouble in the past for saying, you know, here's emissions demand that we've taken from the um, IEA, the International Energy Agency, and like, here's how our business will be resilient against these emissions. And basically they've cherry picked one out of several emissions futures that the IEA has actually produced, one of the least likely ones, and just, and you know, shown that to their investors as if that is the future. And that can definitely be seen as misleading. And some companies have gotten trouble in trouble for this in the past. And there's, you know, more and less sophisticated ways to be misleading about this. And physical risk has received less attention so far, but really it needs to be a bigger concern in a lot of ways. And this is a, um, another field that is moving and evolving really quickly. Right now, the SEC proposed rule asks for disclosure of location-based risks at the zip code level. And that's um, we can talk more about that in the Q&A if it comes up. So concerns at the fund level. Um, did the fund simply rebrand re as ESG with no substantive change to their methodology? There's been so much reporting about this of, you know, a certain funds, fund necessarily happens to have a bunch of German and Japanese companies in it, magically gets rebranded as ESG. And it's not clear if the investment methodology underlying that fund has like really been tilted in any real ESG way. Um, is the composition of the fund consistent with the prospectus? Like how you describe your investment methodology, does it make sense when you actually look at what companies are in the fund? Do fund investors, when you pick the fund from a menu of funds, do you understand what the sustainability fund means? Like you might think that it means you're putting your money towards decarbonization, and it might actually just mean that the investor is sort of using the emissions metrics as like a pure, hedging against transition risk you know trying to buffer against transition risk is a different motivation than trying to actively invest in low carbon technologies and those issues can be very confused in the way that esg funds market themselves now and this is my final this is my final point for this slide and i'll wrap up very shortly you know does how the fund vote on clear esg issues is that consistent with how they market themselves you know if you're an esg or low carbon or climate fund you might assume that the fund votes for all the climate votes that have happened at all the annual general meetings at all these companies and that's not always the case so that's another issue and then this is this is getting a little bit into the weeds but there's different types of esg funds and this sort of matters and it matters in the bigger picture too even as we think of as Representative Kasten mentioned in the beginning, you know, we use the stock market and we use equities and debt to move assets in the economy and we hope that they're doing a good job. And, you know, but this is how actually assets are, move, are being moved in the economy. You know, some people use ESG metrics as sort of one factor among many, and we can think about whether that's doing what investors think they think the fund should be doing, you know, what is ESG risk? This has become sort of an annoying question. Like, it, is it flood risk? Is it emissions? So this is sort of a wild west. Um, and these all have different levels of disclosure uh, under the proposed rules. So we can talk about this more in the Q&A if there's interest. But I'll just flag the ESG impact. That's the fund that claims that they are actually advancing low carbon solutions, the economy, or pushing for plastics, or increasing diversity even, you know, trying to advance certain social goals in the economy. Um, and right now it's very confusing for a client investor to, to really understand the difference between these funds. And I will stop there and move on to the next president presenter and hopefully we can return to some of this in the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Madison, that was great. Uh, and your slides were uh, very informative. It's a great reminder to me to remind everyone in our audience that all of our presentation materials will be available on our website after the briefing, actually pretty shortly after the briefing. Uh, that's at www.eesi.org. In addition, uh, we'll have the archived webcast, so you can come back and, and watch any of this if you uh, would like to revisit 
any of Madison's presentations or the upcoming presentations. And in a short amount of time, we'll also have written summary notes so you can easily skim the content, including the Q&A uh, from our briefing today. That brings us to our second panelist. Emily Wasley is a practice leader with WSP USA. She leads WSP's corporate climate risk, adaptation and resilience practice in the US, assessing and managing the physical risks of climate change and the risks and opportunities associated with transitioning to a low carbon economy consistent with the guidance provided by the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Emily, it's great to see you today. Welcome to the briefing. I'll turn it over to you. Daniel, um, and Madison really laid a good foundation for me to describe to you today a little bit more in detail of the alignment of the SEC proposed rule that came into, um, into our world in March of 2022 this year. Um, that that uh, legislative uh, proposal um, really lines with two components of corporate um, greenhouse gas and climate change um, information. So it aligns with the task force and climate related financial disclosure. Um, this is the TCFD that I'm going to be going into a little bit more depth about, as well as the greenhouse gas protocol. So the greenhouse gas protocol really looks at the scope um, one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions, really looks at companies um, understanding of what their footprint looks like, um, both direct and indirect emissions. Um, and the TCFD framework is what I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail here. I'm also going to cover a little bit of um, information about what's happening in the corporate space on adaptation and resilience. Um, but as Madison mentioned, there's not enough happening. So I'll probably try to iterate that, um, reiterate that with my, my talking point. So um, leading up to um, the, the Paris Agreement in 2015, and shortly after the financial crisis in 2028 to 2020, 2008 to 2009, um, the G20 established the Financial Stability Board, the FSB. So um, this FSB was established internationally to really look at systemic risks to the global financial system. Um, one of these risks is climate change. And Mark Carney was the chair of the FSB um, from 2011 to 2018. And he had a very famous speech that spoke all about how climate change is, as a systemic risk is having an effect already and will continue to have an effect on the global financial system. So because of that, and because he was the chair of the FSB, um, he asked that a task force be formed in 2015, um, leading up to the Paris Agreement. And this task force is, again, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. Uh, the task force was co-chaired by former Mayor Michael Bloomberg, um, and members of the task force included investors, preparers of disclosure, and rating agencies. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the purpose of the task force was to really better understand and um, develop a framework for investors to be able to better understand what climate risks um, exist for publicly traded companies, for those companies that they're investing in, so that they can then inform their capital allocation decisions. Um, what did they produce? Well, they produced a final report in 2017, and that's kind of considered the Bible of TCFD. Everything you need to know um, about TCFD is in there. It includes the final recommendations, and these recommendations really outline a voluntary framework uh, for climate-related disclosures that includes four core elements, uh, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but um, because of this final report that was released in 2017, investors around the world have been really encouraging publicly traded companies to voluntarily disclose their climate related risks and opportunities and how they're managing those. Um, because it's voluntary, um, that is why it's so important for this SEC proposed ruling to really come to fruition, because um, although companies are, are voluntarily disclosing data, it's not happening at the, the pace that we really need to happen because climate change is accelerating, we need to have um, these disclosures and actions by corporations uh, really happening on the ground more significantly. The TCFD recommendations also include a, a variety of different core principles that disclosures need to be relevant, specific, complete, clear, balanced, um, comparable, so that the investors can really look across the sectors and the type of 
com companies that are disclosing this um, information and really be able to say, okay, is this sector really moving in, in, the, in the direction of climate action that needs to occur? Um, or do we need to really um, speak with them and see how they can do so more aggressively? Um, the recommendations also um, aim to provide disclosures that are forward looking and decision useful. Decision useful, um, you can put data out there, but if it's not decision useful and it's not informing investors on how climate change is affecting uh, publicly traded companies or different sectors, it's not going to be decision useful. So again, as I mentioned, um, this 2017 final report is really the, the culmination of the task force recommendations um, that really lay out a solid foundation for companies to publicly disclose their climate related financial um, impacts. So uh, Mark Carney, again, the chair of the, the Financial Stability Board, believed uh, at the time, and it's still true, that with better information as a foundation, we can build a virtuous cycle circle of better understanding of tomorrow's risks better pricing for investors, better decisions by policymakers, and a smoother transition to a low carbon economy. Um, the, the core crux of the recommendations I'll go into shortly, but um, what I really wanted to highlight here is that um, because the TCFD really highlights both transition risks and opportunities, but also physical risks and opportunities, um, there's a need for, a growing need for transition plans to really once they uh, once the companies understand what their risks are for both transition and, and physical they need to have a plan and how to manage those risks so transition planning has been um, increasingly um, of interest for publicly traded companies to really publicly disclose a transition plan investors are requesting these um, and adaptation plans are are being discussed in the eu uh, European Union, but not as much in the United States as it needs to be. So um, adaptation planning is really, as Madison mentioned, lagging behind transition planning. So there's increasing value for the TCFD recommendations. Um, here on the right is the graphic that illustrates the four core elements that I just described. Um, but implementing the TCFD recommendations effectively and equitably can really be a vehicle for organizational change management and mainstreaming climate change across all decisions that companies make. So it's really a great um, global best practice for climate risk management and disclosure if done effectively and transparently and equitably. So those components um, I really want to emphasize because you can put out um, information that's aligned with TCFD um, but if you're not putting out information that's un helping investors understand how you're managing these risks and, and taking action on climate change, um, they're really not decision useful and it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be into that greenwashing um, realm that Madison described. Um, because the TCFD was created by investors, um, it's been really um, interesting to see the uptick in, um, in the number of TCFD aligned disclosures and TCFD standalone reports. Um, State Street, BlackRock, Vanguard, all significant investors in publicly traded companies in the United States have all encouraged their um, the companies that they invest in to align with TCFDs because they understand that it's, it provides greater transparency around climate risk and it enables their own decision useful information. Um, really, the TCFD also looks at forward looking physical and transition risks and opportunities. So it really takes this realm of looking at both actual risks, so risks that companies have faced today, perhaps they've experienced um, litigation risks that, um, that uh, Madison mentioned, or perhaps they have experienced um, physical risks to their supply chain and it's you know interrupted their business operations. Um, but they also need to look at what may happen in the future using uh, scientific climate scenarios. So um, I'll go into that in a little bit later. But if you're going to take one thing away from this presentation today, it's um, this is the the core four core elements of TCFD and the 11 core disclosures. So from that 2017 report, this is the snapshot of what you really need to understand and how when people say, what are the TCFD recommendations? This is that. So uh, when we look at governance, it's looking at the disclosure of a, the organization or company's governance around climate related risks and opportunities. Um, it's looking at the board oversight and how management within the company is assessing and managing 
these climate related risks and opportunities. So really looking at how the organization is governed and if it's governed for climate action or if it's really not governed for climate action and um, the company needs to disclose how it's going to be overseeing the climate related risks and opportunities that they have identified. The strategy component is really looking at the business strategy. So um, disclosing, as I mentioned before, the actual and potential impacts of climate related risks and opportunities to the organization's business, um, its business strategy and financial planning where information is material. So materiality has a, its own um, description. I'm sure many of you are aware of what that looks like. Um, and that's kind of the contention um, on the SEC proposed ruling is, do we do companies disclose material topics um, or do they disclose all topics that are, are useful to them? Um, when we go into risk management, it's really disclosing how the organization identifies, assesses, and manages the climate-related risks. And then we go into metrics and targets. So how companies are making progress towards managing those risks, towards reducing the, uh, the risks to their organization and to the communities where they live and work. So Madison briefly went into kind of the, the various different uh, types of risks when we talk about climate related risks. Um, here we have transition risks, which can be policy and legal, uh, technological risks, um, market risks with market shifts, cons consumers wanting different products that are more sustainable and reputational risks. This comes when the greenwashing discussion happens. Um, companies can really face significant reputational risks if they're saying one thing, but investing in uh, fossil fuels and continuing to do that. Uh, physical risks are both acute and chronic. So looking at extreme weather events, but also the systemic issues around climate change with which talk to kind of sea level rise, higher temperatures, changing precipitation patterns. Um, and then we look at different opportunities as well. And so um, these opportunities include opportunities for more sustainable and resilient future. So, resource efficiency that could include energy and water, um, different energy sources, renewable energy, um, the development of new products and services that are more sustainable and resilient. Um, again, new markets that are driving a, you know, climate action and resilience. Um, all of these recent opportunities have financial impacts to co companies. And the way that we look at that is through their income statement, their cash flow statement and balance sheet. So I mentioned climate scenarios. This is really at the heart of TCFD. Um, what investors really want to understand are, you know, what have the risks been to date, but also under a variety of different uh, future scenarios or future narratives, um, how could climate change impact the, the company's business strategy? So if it's a business strategy that's, you know, focused on fossil fuel and um, that's gonna have pretty significant transition risks if that company is trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So um, this graphic on the left really looks at a variety of different um, future climate scenarios that companies look to when they're doing their qualitative and quantitative scenario analysis for really better understanding what risks they might face in the future um, and how they can actually manage those risks uh, moving forward. On the right here really looks at the difference between the significant difference between a 1.5 degree um, change in temperature globally and a two point um, a two degree um, change. So there are impacts that um, will be more significant if we continue to reduce or re continue to release greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll have more uh, physical risks under a two degree scenario than a 1.5. So this gets into a little bit more detail. So 1.5 degree warming, um, that means that if we keep it at 1.5 degrees, if we you know, align to the Paris Agreement, we'll have less physical risks, we'll have more significant transition risks, but also more transition opportunity. So we'll see kind of large rapid greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, we will have some mitigated, you know, some reduction in physical risks, but not completely eliminated because we've already released enough greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere to have those physical risks be baked into the system. Um, we'll have more significant carbon pricing and disruption from the tra transition to renewable energy with less energy intensive options. So that will be um, really kind of the 1.5 degree scenario outlook. A four degree warming 
um, is kind of the trajectory that we're on right now. And we really need to slow this. So with a four degree warming, we'll have much more significant physical risks. We'll have less transition risks. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise. We'll very slowly see a transition to low carbon um, future. Um, we'll have much more significant damage to assets and infrastructure. We'll have populations migrating. Um, we'll have productivity loss across the world. Um, supply chains will supply chains chains will continue to have um, significant impacts, and economic losses uh, will be considerable from the climate impacts we face. So really. Our future is determined by how we choose as humans to take action on climate. So with that all said, um, the TCFD recommendation and alignment with TCFD is quite a journey. Um, implementing the TCFD recommendations, um, really we've seen um, through our work with different corporate clients, um, a progression of, you know, starting with identifying an internal working group. So having champions within the company to really move this, um, this effort along, um, getting buy-in from the financial, from auditing, from uh, a variety of different entities to really understand what, how climate change is going to impact um, the company in its, through these champions uh, in a working group. We're going to be, then uh, we develop um, a gap analysis of existing processes. So we look at, are the companies TCFD aligned, and if they're not, where do they need to better align? Um, we then get into scenario analysis, understanding potential futures, and then we get into kind of the mainstreaming of how does how do we actually integrate climate considerations into and across all business functions within a company, and what does that mean in terms of decision making for future investments, uh, future um, assets that they want to manage and operate in the future. So I'll, I'll, this is one of my last slides, but um, just to give you a little bit of background on the difference between um, adaptation planning and transition planning, um, what we're really seeing is on the adaptation side, we think about actions that manage physical impacts of climate change. So flood protection, natural infrastructure, cooling centers, business continuity planning. We then also have transition planning. So sustainable transportation, actions that really reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. In the middle, we have those co-benefits. So they provide um, benefits for adaptation and transition, transitioning. So those include water and energy conservation, community building, and urban forest. So we really want to make sure that we're seeing both transition planning happening, but also adaptation planning. And to be honest, like not a lot of um, adaptation actions are taking place within the corporate space. Um, there are a couple that have been really moved by different initiatives that are global in nature. So the UN Global Compact, uh, which aligns with the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals have really been pushing on both you know, adaptation and uh, resilience, as well as the greenhouse gas emission reduction efforts for transitioning. Um, the CEO water mandate, which was established in 2000, really has a good focus on adaptation. Um, but again, more is definitely needed. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Daniel for the next speaker. Thanks, Emily. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, take a moment uh, before I introduce our third panelist to remind everyone in our audience that we uh, will have some time for Q&A at the end of our briefing today. And if anyone in our online audience would like to send us a question, you can do that one of two ways or both. You can send us an email and the email address to use is askask at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at EESI online and send it to us uh, that way as well. We encourage that for sure. Uh, our third panelist today is Jane Jag. Jane is the Deputy Director of Net Zero Finance at the We Mean Business Coalition. Jane works with companies to ensure more useful and reliable climate data to investors and with investors to find better ways to work with the provided data. Jane, great to see you today. I will uh, turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much for having us and thank you for giving us the opportunity to discuss this important topic. Um, as indicated, my name is Jane Jack and uh, I am the Deputy Director for Net Zero Finance at We Mean Business Coalition. 
And we are a coalition of seven NGOs, and we try to coordinate our work and efforts on climate action together with 9,000 companies in the entire world to achieve the global goal of having the emissions by 2030. I personally have a financial and auditor background, and you will also hear that in a moment. But I have also worked with ESG and sustainability for the last decade in large listed companies and in academia. In my current role at We Mean Business Coalition, I work with companies to make them report in a better way, and I work with investors to use this better reporting. Next slide, please. So to achieve the goal of having the emissions globally, we also need to need support from good reporting legislation, whereby the capital providers, they can funnel their capital to the greenest profitable ideas and companies, but also to the companies which are on their way. For that, we need more and better company reporting, but at the same time, we need simplified legislation. So all, also the SMEs, can do quality reporting without breaking the bank, while the reporting is still useful. Now that's the trick. So. ESG has for a long, long time been an alphabet soup of reporting frameworks, which has not been helpful for companies or investors. Thus, we are very hopeful that with regards to the new International Sustainability Standards Board that was created last year and who this year have launched the first set of reporting standards. We are also very supportive to see that the US SEC launched the enhancement and standardization of climate related disclosures for investors, which I today will shorten and say US SEC climate law. I would like to mention here that there have been other uh, local legislation and standards launched this year, but today I will focus only on these two and how they fit, but you can also ask for or about the others if you want to. Uh, next slide please. Um, so why do we even care whether the current draft for US SEC climate law fits with the international standards? Well, because it is the most efficient for companies. Think of all the listed companies which are dual listed, say on London Stock Exchange and New York Stock Exchange, or companies who have large subsidiaries in other jurisdictions, which may also be forced to report locally to that single legal entity, then it is so much easier and cheaper if there is only one set of reporting framework to cater for, or at least a common baseline. Now that's why we call for, global, for a global baseline, but also because it is much, much better and more efficient for the investors that they immediately can compare the data from all companies globally. That will make their investment choice far better informed and they can funnel their capital to the most profitable green ideas. Next slide, please. So the first question is, how do ISSB and the US SEC climate law fit? Actually fairly well, it's not that far off. Um, there are of course minor elements that one could fine tune, but overall not that far off. But we would though recommend that the following larger refinements are done. We need to future-proof the alignment for that, we need two changes in the legislation. And to secure cost efficiency and useful reporting, we also need one fundamental clarification in the legislation. I will explain that now. Next slide, please. To future-proof the international alignment, there should be a clear reference to the ISSB. As you can imagine, the ISSB will develop in the coming years. And just like the financial reporting standards like the US GAAP or IFRS has developed over time. So if the US SEC climate law is to maintain the current nice convergence with the ISSB, there must be a clear reference. That will be the easiest and most trustworthy for all. Next slide, please. The current draft is based on TCFD. And as Emily just told us, that is a good thing. But that will also entail that the companies are to report on climate resilience, which may also cover reporting on climate risks and opportunities. Risk reporting is not the issue here. That, that is actually given by existing reporting laws. Um, the company have to report a risk, that is given. But opportunity reporting, that is problematic for the listed companies. Let me give you an example. 
say you're a transport company with a fleet of diesel trucks and you want to reduce your emissions and transparently report on this to your investors. So you make a CO2 target for 2030 and you publish a plan for how you will reach that target. That plan might include the opportunity to change the fleet of trucks into new trucks driven by other fuels before the competitors. But the technical solution you foresee now in 22 may be outdated or the availability of these trucks might be very limited when the time hits and you are to replace the current trucks. But now you have promised a given technical solution for your company to the market. So your company risks being litigated for giving such an unsolicited promise to the market. With the current legislation, will it be especially problematic for the listed companies to report on these forward-looking elements, which sometimes may not come true, without risking being privately litigated? But the investors need to see the plans to be able to evaluate if the targets have any substance to them and are not just wishful thinking or even worse, greenwashed marketing. Therefore, we need that climate scenario reporting and target setting for the CO2 emission to be subject to the general safe harbor protections under the Private Security Litigation Reform Act. We also call on this because we can already now foresee that dual listed companies will be placed in a very difficult legal situation, simply because it will be mandatory to develop and report on these plans in some jurisdictions that follow ISSB, while it will be problematic to do so in the US if this is not fixed. Next slide, please. So apart from these two changes I have just described, um, we also have a recommendation for a clarification, which will both enhance the usability for the reporting and also reduce costs for companies. For the non-financial data to be truly useful, it is important that it has context from the financial data, whereby the company, for instance, can say that with this revenue, this production, this cash flow, we pollute this much. But that, of course, requires that the boundaries for the two sets of data are aligned Otherwise, will it be apples against oranges and the current suggested carbon intensity KPI will be useless. Using financial boundaries means that the financial rules for consolidation are reused. It also means that the rules for leasing are prolonged and reused as well, which means it must be clarified that emissions from owned and used assets must be included in scope one and two. Now that's the easy one. Now comes the tricky one. Emissions from assets leased in, regardless of operator roles, must also be included in scope one and two. And the consequence of that is that emissions from owned or leased in assets or leased assets which you lease out to others, they cannot be included in scope one or two, but they should be included in scope three. If that is clarified, we will get comparable and useful reporting. The financial rules will also help determine whether a lease is truly a lease or it is sale of services and thus whether the emissions from a given activity are to be included in scope one, two or three and thereby make comparable reporting. Using financial boundaries will also enhance the company's ability to reuse their existing ERP and consultation systems for greenhouse gas data which will reduce cost and time spent by the companies as they do not have to buy a specific ESG system. They can simply reuse and extend the existing systems. And you can trust me, it is not that complicated and it does not take that long time to fix that within a given company, even if they have hundreds of subsidiaries. I have done it and it can be done. Using financial boundaries will also make it possible for the audit to be done on reasonable level as it will be possible to assess completeness of the greenhouse gas reporting, which is close to impossible if there is no context for the data. For instance, you never get fuels for free. Thus, you can extract both the fuel cost and the quantities from the invoices. And there you have it, a strong external evidence from the invoices that the fuel consumption for the CO2 calculation is in fact complete. So for all these fantastic reasons, we strongly, strongly urge for that the boundaries are defined to be financial. 
that must be clarified in the legislation. Next slide, please. So to sum it up, the current legislation draft is actually fairly good and we support it definitely. But to future-proof the international alignment, we need it to refer specifically to ISSB and we need a safe harbor for forward-looking statements regarding climate. And finally, to ensure the cost efficiency for companies and ensuring the data is actually useful for the investors, please clarify that the reporting boundaries have to be financial. Thank you for your time and for listening. Jane, uh, very much for joining us today uh, and for your presentation. Um, a good reminder uh, that presentation materials will be available online. So if you missed any of that, if you'd like to go back and revisit Jane's slides, or if you would like to um, go back and rewatch any of our briefing, um, you're welcome to do that at www.esi.org. Everything's uh, freely available, of course. Uh, and we'll also have some written notes uh, after uh, after our briefing. It'll take us take us a couple of weeks to get those up, but they're really, really useful. Our fourth panelist today is Ryan McQueenie. Ryan is a sustainable investment stewardship analyst for Westpath Benefits and Investments. Uh, as part of the stewards, as part of the stewardship team, uh, which is an industry leader in sustainable investment. I'm sorry. Sorry, Ryan. As part of the stewardship team at Westpath which is an industry leader in sustainable investment, Ryan supports the organization's participation in the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and its thought leadership on climate risk. The word stewardship, that's a tough one for me today. So I'll keep that in mind when we get to the Q&A. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Really looking forward to what you have to tell us today. Great, thank you. Well, hopefully uh, it doesn't trip me up too much because I'm going to say stewardship several times throughout the next several minutes. So um, I'll open my slides. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, you touched on a little bit of that background of who Westpath is. I think the important thing to know about kind of our mission is uh, where we sit in the investor ecosystem. So we're an asset owner. Um, we are focused on pensions, retirement and health benefits, as well as endowment investing. And specifically, we uh, provide retirement services and investing for um, the United Methodist Church, and it's approximately 100,000 current and former employees, as well as a number of Methodist related foundations, endowments, and other nonprofits. So, um, as an investor focused on those things, right, pensions, retirement, health benefits, endowments, we're primarily focused on the long term. So, really, everything we do is grounded in creating the most long term value for our investors uh, over the long run. And so, you know, we have dedicated ESG strategies. We're certainly committed to incorporating ESG considerations. Um, we also have non-dedicated ESG strategies, and we're still working on um, creating the most long-term value in those investments by stewarding those assets with sustainability and ESG best practices in mind. And, you know, there's that word again, investor stewardship. Um, you might hear folks call it engagement. You might hear folks call it active ownership. Um, this is a big part of our process. We engage on quite a few sustainability topics, not the least of which, of course, is climate change. Um, and so that kind of gets me back to our main question uh, today, which is why do standardized climate risk disclosures matter for investors and for companies? Um, so for me, from our perspective, one key answer is that it provides us and other investors that are doing this engagement work, that are doing this stewardship work um, on climate specifically, it provides us with much, much better information regarding how exposed our investments are uh, to climate risk and how these companies are managing it. And then it also adds an accountability mechanism to the engagement conversations, right? If we are pledging um, this type of transition plan or we're committing to this type of transition plan, over five, 10, 15 years, you know, this reporting adds you know, additional clarity and, and, and accountability to that. Um, so believe it or not, that's the short answer. <laughs> the long answer to the question really is, is what I'll go over in the next few, few slides. Um, but before I jump into anything else further, I just wanna say everything I'm about to say is really pulled from this paper you see on the right hand uh, of the slide, which is uh, the future of investor engagement. Uh, we co-authored this through our membership in the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, um, and I believe we've made it available to you all in the materials for day, today. If not, it's definitely available for free online. 
Um, so please, if you want to dive deeper into anything I mentioned, it's an excellent resource. I'm going to do a quick overview, but you could spend a lot more time with it if you're interested. Um, all right, so we've got that picture. Let's define some key terms. Um, as I mentioned, stewardship in this context refers to investor action. So that includes corporate engagement and proxy voting. For years, that's kind of been the traditional definition, corporate engagement and proxy voting. Um, but as we propose in this paper, and I think it's totally reasonable to include this in an overarching definition, definition of stewardship, um, this can also include investor engagement with policymakers and regulators. It can also include investors convening uh, engagement conversations with entire sectors and value chains, right? Having representatives and dialogues from an entire top-down value chain uh, is a new form of investor stewardship um, that I think we'd really like to see fleshed out more. Um, then before I go further, I want to just do a quick aside on that proxy voting element, especially in the context of the SEC's uh, proposed climate rule. Um, you know, I think we'll get into this more, or we can get into this more uh, if it's of interest, but um, you know, I think there's a big question about the legal viability or standing of the rule. Um, I just wanted to note on proxy voting, the SEC is very much empowered to regulate disclosure that investors deem relevant to their proxy voting. Um, we saw that in the comment letters. I think that makes sense and should be a big part of the narrative going forward for S investors and allies um, that are proponents of this rule, um, that is providing key information that will influence proxy voting decisions. That's something that's really important for the SEC to hear. Um, it's very much within uh, the SEC's purview. Um, so moving on, kind of just sticking with our definitions here. Um, systemic risk. A couple of folks on the panel have already mentioned systemic risk, and I think it's really, really important. Uh, what do we mean by that from, from the context of an investor? Um, talk about risk all the time, of course, in investing, right? Something like country risk, where all of our investments are in the U.S., um, so we are exposed to the ebbs and flows of the U.S. economy, and we go buy international assets companies to, to counteract that. Um, maybe it's equity risk where we're all invested in stocks that go up and down every day for various reasons. So we go buy bonds to hedge that risk a little bit, uh, provide a little bit more stability. A systemic risk cannot be diversified away like that. It inherent to uh, kind of the challenge that it brings is that you can't diversify it. Um, out of the portfolio. So climate change is probably the best example of this. There are some others that we could dive into, but um, you know, climate is an understandable, right? We could sell all the things today that seem like they have more climate risk, let's say in oil and gas company stock, but that doesn't mean climate change just isn't happening anymore in the real economy or isn't having an effect on the real economy anymore. It's still very much an issue that's going to affect all of our other investments in myriad ways. And I appreciate that pretty much everyone in the panel has brought up, you know, different definitions of transition and physical risks. Um, these are still really challenging risks to grapple with. Um, and it's really challenging from an investor's perspective because our traditional tools like asset allocation don't really land on a solution, right? So we have to think about, and that's why we think about how investment stewardship and engagement can help manage this risk, how we can use the other tools that are available to us as investors um, to, to, to try to land on the solution or at least influence uh, the economy getting to a solution. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to touch on the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance a little bit more. It's a UN convened coalition, it's about 70 members right now, uh, or a little over 70 now, uh, represents over $10 trillion in AUM uh, from all the members combined. Um, again, you know, it's in the name, it's all asset owners, so mostly pension funds and insurance, co insurance companies, all committed to achieving net zero portfolio emissions by 2050 and setting, setting interim targets over five year periods along the way, and really crucially doing the best we can to support the change needed in the economy that is consistent with a 1.5 degree scenario. So, you know, getting back to our core theme here, the Alliance and its members absolutely need quality climate disclosures. I mentioned those interim targets. Every five years, we're setting, setting interim targets. Anecdote from Westpath, uh, our experience setting our first target, um, obviously we first need to get a baseline. We need to know where we're at now. So we did kind of a full carbon footprinting of our portfolio. 
when analyzing our U.S. equity fund uh, to establish that baseline, we learned that only approximately 50% of the market value of our funds investment companies were self-reporting the data that we needed. Um, so the other 50% is, is all estimates, right? And mind you, we have to then, then go get a service provider um, to, and pay for that service provider to come in and do those estimates for us. So, um, you know, that's one practical reason right there. We believe that improved data methodology will help, uh, you know, alleviate resource expenditures and reliance on third party data uh, providers that that's currently required. So, um, you know, helps uh, save us some some money, be, help us be better stewards of our uh, investors capital, which is certainly um, you know, going to help us fulfill our fiduciary obligations to them. Um, wanted to get on the weeds a little bit more on corporate engagement. What are we doing when we are going to engage companies on climate? Um, I think the simplest way to think about it is we're doing, we're trying to get companies to do more to decarbonize or to address climate risks, right? There's some low hanging fruit here. And this, this kind of assumes that we've already captured the low hanging fruit, the stuff that is going to be resulting in obvious uh, near-term benefits, uh, profit maximization to the company where we're transitioning to renewables or securing some sort of low carbon alternative is, is an obvious short-term benefit. Um, assuming we are, you know, have good enough management companies in the portfolio level to get us there, from beyond that, what we're talking about is doing more, oftentimes increasing near-term costs um, investing in a plan that will benefit us over the long term um, by reducing climate risk and contributing to real economy decarbonization. Um, and so there's inherently that short term, long term tension there. Um, but still, you know, we believe that climate change is among the number one potential disruptors of economic activity. So there's plenty of reasons for companies to want to move up this kind of steepening cost curve even if there is more near-term resources needed. Um, the real trouble for investors pursuing this engagement, and, and companies get that, by the way. Sometimes we meet resistance on that, but I think for the most part, companies understand that. Um, the real trouble for investors and companies pursuing this type of model, this type of engagement approach, is that there are many other things at play here that limit the efficacy of the approach. Um, and that is laid out in, in, in further detail in the paper, as I mentioned um we've got five highlighted here i'd point everyone in the context of this conversation to limit number three um inefficiencies of focusing on voluntary company by company disclosure um one of the main realities of corporate engagement on climate is that a ton of our energy is spent on encouraging companies to just do more disclosure so obviously the end goal is decarbonization and mitigating that, that climate risk um all that related information is essential for measuring and holding companies accountable to it, as I mentioned. But we're spending so much of our time right now just on stuff that is essentially covered by the SEC's proposed climate rule. So one nice thing about that climate rule is it frees up a ton of our time to focus on other stuff, which is what the other thing I would point out specifically highlight in this conversation is limit number five, which we're saying uh, are the boundaries set by the rules of the game you can essentially think of the rules of the game as the policy and regulatory frameworks that we're operating under. Um, so we've kind of described that here um, with a look at scenarios, uh, you know, those, how those policy and regulatory frameworks could align with different uh, global warming scenarios. Um, but this is just kind of getting into the practical realities and, and where companies and investors are limited in their ability uh, to support, you know, economy-wide decarbonization and, and that systemic change that is going to be needed um, to really get us uh, closer to a 1.5 degree tra trajectory. We're talking about, you know, actual economic incentives that companies um, have to seek decarbonization. We're talking about subsidies. We're talking about price and pricing mechanisms that actually change, you know, global energy supply and demand. Um, dynamics. And ultimately, we're talking about things that are set by governments and set out by policymakers, um, significant legislation, significant judicial precedent needed, um, more ambitious and, and coordinated management of climate change on a global scale. Um, and again, there's only so much of that that investors and companies can do themselves. So there's a lot of work 
that we need done by policymakers. And, you know, doesn't mean we should be sitting on our hands and saying like, gee, I hope this policy comes one day. Um, we can go out and influence it. We can encourage companies to influence it too. I think we should be investors spending a lot more time on policy engagement and companies should be doing a lot more proactive lobbying in support of the Paris Agreement goals in support of those economic incentives like carbon pricing. Um, right now we're stuck talking about disclosure and, and we're, we're focusing on kind of those key, uh, you know, accountability mechanisms at the, at the portfolio company level. Um, something like the SEC's climate rule helps us get past that point where we can spend way more of our time um, on this really essential political engagement um, and, and pushing for, for policy change that's essentially going to be what's needed uh, to, to affect the systemic change that we need. Um, anyway, and you know, getting back to our remit as investors, you know, managing the risks in our portfolio and delivering our value, delivering the best long-term value for our beneficiaries is our job, right? And if you know, we think this is consistent with delivering the best long-term value for our beneficiaries, so it's fully our responsibility to be doing as much of this as we can. We just know that collaboration and coordination with policymakers is is going to be essential at the end of the day to to making this successful effort. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ryan. And that's a great uh, sentiment uh, that this is part of your job, uh, I think, to end the presentation portion of the briefing on today. Um, Ryan, you mentioned that you recommended uh, a report, the future of investor engagement calls for systemic stewardship. You did much better than me on that word today to address systemic climate risk. That resource is available on our briefing webpage. Uh, and also Madison and Jane recommended some resources as well. And we've posted all of that on the briefing webpage along with the presentation materials and you'll also be able to find an archived webcast. Um, I'll invite all of our panelists to turn their videos on and we will proceed with the Q&A. Um, thanks to everybody who's um, asking us questions online. Um, we're going to start with a question about, um, and I think we've covered it, but I think it would be good now that everyone's heard the presentations maybe to revisit it. And Madison, we'll start with you since you were our first presenter today. From different perspectives of stakeholders, how would standardized climate risk disclosures be helpful? Uh, and how would it be helpful differently for different types of stakeholders? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, there's many layers to this question too. And I think that it's been, you know, I've been focused on the question of regulation of climate risk for many years, and it's clearly gone through like generational changes as more and more people take it seriously and try to actually solve real world problems. So, you know, there's one problem, which is many of the ways that you are expected to report scope three emissions, so your supply chain emissions, they're not actually your measured emissions, you just use like recommended equations for how to calculate what those emissions likely are. And there's a lot of flexibility in the equations that you use, even the ones that are sort of, you know, legitimate in the eyes of the investor community, and they can really sway scope three reporting between different industries. And then there's sort of, so that's one way standardization could help, but then there's even like a bigger, more difficult question, which I think is getting beyond your, your question, your question, which is, in which ways can it not help or in which ways are we like still evolving um and it's not i think that people are starting to realize that you know scope three we need this information because we need sight on supply change and where, where there's exposure it's not clear that scope three is the best measure of transition risk like once you start to boil you know it matters on your like jurisdictional exposure or like the type of industry you're invested in um you know, there could be a steel company that is actually doing a ton of research on decarbonization and like putting a ton of money into it. And for like a decade, its emissions don't go down, but then they switch over and their emissions plummet. And like you maybe haven't captured that really if you're only doing some sort of crude scope three analysis. So I think, you know, we could talk more about that as we go in the Q&A and, you know, I see Jane nodding, but I think this is a really rapidly evolving space and it's almost like we need step one scope scope emissions and then move beyond that, which is starting to happen with the investor regulation is like, what do you think 
these funds are doing when they say they're accounting for transition risk? Like, what does that really mean? And it, you know, yeah, we'll stop there. Thanks, um, Emily. From your perspective, uh, you know, what what is the, how does this helpful to different types of stakeholders in the, you know, sort of the ecosystem of a, of financial institutions and investors that we've been talking about today? You know, Madison hit on a lot of good points, and I think um, it really just helps. Um, set the stage and set a good baseline for everyone to be on the same page, understanding that climate change is a systemic risk. Um, it is impacting already the financial, the global financial system. Um, and just accepting that so that we can move forward to take action. Um, there's going to be a variety of different levels of disclosure, uh, reporting, and there's no consistency yet. But I am hopeful with the ISSB and with um, the proposed SEC um, ruling that we will have some sort of consistency for reporting um, because it really helps all stakeholders not only um, go through the process of understanding what their risks are, um, exploring that, really looking at um, what, because what we have found with different companies that we work with um, is this process of of assessing climate change really brings together the traditional sustainability folks with the financial, with the audit, with the, um, the engineers. And it really kind of brings folks together to understand how climate change really affects all kind of business functions within a company. Um, what we're not seeing enough of, which I think um, is really uh, important, is this leaning in of companies into the communities and how they're investing in resilience for the communities, um, how they're investing in adaptation measures. We've seen a lot of different companies originally say, you know, sea level rise is not an issue for me. But when we dig into the supply chain issue, it is. Um, and so that extends their reach in terms of what they need to understand for physical climate impact. So it really helps all stakeholders and just being transparent um, is a good practice. You know, companies are already um, disclosing risks. Climate change is another risk that they face. And being honest and truthful about that is just really important. Jane, let's go to you next. I'd love to hear your thoughts and then we'll wrap up this question with Ryan. Yeah, sure. Um, I think one thing that we could potentially gain from having a more comparable reporting and a more widespread reporting from more companies, as Ryan also indicated, would actually be that we potentially could get rid of some of the ESG ratings. Uh, and they are not uh, uh, popular by companies, I can guarantee that part. And as I understand it, investors are not very keen on them either. They're easy to use, that part I understand, but they are not very good. What would be fantastic would be if we could use the data directly from the companies, just like we today can use their revenue or their earning. Then we could have, for instance, on trading platforms, we could have earning per share, next column, CO2 per share, for instance. That would be fantastic that they Brian, over to you. Ag agreed 100% with that. And I think it goes back to, you know, what I was mentioning from an investor's perspective is frees up a whole bunch of time to start focusing on other things, including a bunch of the stuff everybody else is mentioning, right? How do we invest in actual low carbon solutions? How do we start having more advanced dialogues with the companies we're engaging about how they can be using their influence to push for, um, you know, ambitious, ambitious climate policy? Um, you know, I don't want to sound too cynical and negative, but like at some point we're still stuck doing all these engagements on climate disclosure and we really need to get past that point and, and, and into action. Um, one thing I will say on that though is, is I mean, I think we've all hinted at this in different ways. Of course, disclosure is not action and, and that's, the, the, you know, it's not the, the level of action itself we need. Um, what I would say on that though is, you know, I think there is you know, kind of an undergirding theory to sustainability disclosure that companies are more likely to perform well on something when they're forced to report on it. Um, companies are competitive, right? They don't, you know, we're, we're in a hypothetical near future situation where everyone's reporting standardized uh, climate risk disclosures. Um, we're now getting comparable information across sectors and across value chains. And um, 
slightly optimistic that that might inspire it it's, might itself inspire uh, more more ambitious climate action uh, by companies. Thanks. Um, we got a great question from our audience that I think I'll interject at this moment. And Madison, maybe we'll start with you again. Um, it's something that many of us mentioned, I think, in our comments or uh, in our remarks or presentations. Uh, and the question is, a few of your panelists have mentioned the need to address corporate climate risk equitably. Uh, the assumption is that this is referring to the resulting impacts on people. Could our panelists speak more or could the panelists speak more to what they mean and what some opportunities might be to make all of this more equitable? And Madison, if you'd like to take this one, I'll give you the first chance and then we'll go through the line again. Yeah, I mean, that's a great and complicated question that I have spent some time thinking about, but I think we just need more people thinking about that in a, from many different parts of society. I think one big concern, right, is if you encourage the economy to de-invest from risky areas and invest in less risky areas, then you might be fulfilling this like terrible cycle of people, you know, there's already insurance markets Florida and Louisiana are having trouble in their insurance markets already and like the private insurers are exiting the market and like that can expand to other services and like it can affect municipal bonds and it can affect the structure of society and demographics and gentrification and like all these pretty obvious ways actually when you think about it like it affects insurance rates it affects bond ratings it affects where companies locate in general so you know what do you do about this conundrum in the sense that you're like actually advocating for better pricing and this is you can see this at the micro level when we think about how should the government flood subsidize i mean how should the government fund subsidize flood insurance you know that's not just a risk question it's like a question of how we value things in society so you know there's 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 steps we can do to think about this you know we can think about we have the community reinvestment act in which we require banks to not be racist and, and to fund like a certain part of their investments in certain communities to certain groups, certain underprivileged groups. You could think about using that framework to apply more broadly, integrating that into the Community Reinvestment, Reinvestment Act. I think part of, I think where this intersects with the pure financial risk, and then I'll stop talking, is sort of looping it back to the systemic risk. Like, your building might be fine, your factory might be fine, it might never be flooded. But if all the roads and the like water utilities of the town that your factory relies on, like are not resilient to climate change, then your factory is not resilient to climate change. And so there is this really interesting, I think, sort of like realization of the ways it's almost the, like you didn't build that Elizabeth Warren line. I mean, I'll, I'll stop talking very soon, but there is this very interesting fight between the big tech companies who intentionally built uh like in the san francisco bay and very exposed sea level rise plains with no they knew there was no levees there and now there's a big fight over like who should pay the enormous bill to build the levees like the local municipalities which are not necessarily very rich or facebook and amazon and google are like whoever amazon's not there but you know the that's one example that i think is going to play out in like big and small ways going forward as people try to think of the, all the ways that their supply chains and labor force and like consumers are affected by climate change thanks emily what are some opportunities maybe at our disposal to do what we're talking about today in an equitable way sure so i've given this a lot of thought um and was part of a group of women um international women who did some research on establishing a task force for equity in climate related financial disclosures. So we called it the TECFD. Um, and what we did was we really focused initially on gender equity. And the fact that, you know, Project Drawdown notes in their research that engaging in and, and, and investing in gender equity actually accelerates climate action for corporations. So the fact that, you know, equity um is actually leading to more action on the ground for climate change and other issues um is reason enough for companies to really invest in the s component of e s and g i've noticed that um, there's been so much of a focus on the e component which is great but there's the social and the governance component as well that are so so important um and truly when we think about just as madison said if equity is not centralized in our decision making for climate action we will create this more vicious cycle that's already occurring on the ground where 
we will divest from vulnerable areas and not instead of leaning in to uh, really support and regenerate the resources that companies have extracted for so long um, and it'll just exacerbate our, our global equity issues um, as well so opportunities are um, because of uh, our involvement, WSP's involvement in this TECFD framework, we've actually decided, you know, we're going to walk the talk. So we're going to apply this framework to our own company. WSP is a publicly traded Canadian company, has 70,000 employees worldwide. So we have a great, a significant global reach. We design and engineer infrastructure around the world. So if we can do this and we can identify what does pay equity look like? How does our board oversee the governance of climate action? Um, how are we managing climate change and you know, emphasizing leadership um, and empowering and promoting people of color, women um, across the management line? We can see much more accelerated action as a company. Thank you. Uh, Jane, from the perspective of the We Mean Business Coalition, what are you seeing internationally about ways to to promote equity in all of this for equity um, it's also a matter of being able to um, to diversify the risk profile as ryan also indicated before um, so if if the companies are not providing this information there is a good chance that you might be tilted in one way or the other. So it is enormously important that the reporting covers this. Um, I wonder also, because right now, as you, Emily, indicated, right now we only talk about the E, but I also know that many investors would actually also like to know at least a few S element, elements. For instance, employee turnover, especially the voluntary part. Because if you as a company would like to stand up and say, we will grow, but you can at the same time see that people run out the door faster than fast because they cannot stand being there, then the likelihood for that company to grow is very small. So it, there are several of these non-financial data parts that can be important for, uh, for, for, for the investors. And Ryan, speaking of investors, from your perspective. Yeah, well, I just want to emphasize what Jane just said. We're also not getting that information right now from, from uh, publicly traded companies in the U.S. And we need the SEC to be doing more on human capital disclosures. And they will be, um, which is encouraging. Um, and these are intersectional issues. So I really like that idea of layering these non-financial metrics or these sustainability metrics on top of each other and looking at their relationships. We can't do that if we don't have standardized disclosure on both of those things. So um, really good point there. I would say when I think about equity in this context, right, we know climate change stands to disproportionately affect low income communities, communities of color, marginalized communities, folks with disabilities, that that's true. What we don't want is our solutions to disproportionately negatively affect those folks. Um, Luckily, we got a lot of great people thinking about it. I think the Inflation Reduction Act um, sets a good precedent, um, offering heavier subsidies or additional subsidies um, in the economic justice corridors. I think that's good thinking um, beyond the kind of local community level where folks are going to be more exposed to pollution in certain areas, more exposed to, to flood risk, as, as Madison pointed out, in certain areas. Um, this also happens at the global scale. Um, and this is set out by the Paris Agreement's notion of, of differentiated responsibilities, right? That some countries are more responsible for the carbon that is in the atmosphere already, um, and they should be more responsible for uh, the decarbonization of the global economy. That makes sense. Um, real practical solutions for this, ultimately, I think it gets back to those economic incentives, um, things like carbon pricing, um, and then adding another level to your carbon pricing solutions where you are intentionally reinvesting the revenue that's generated from stuff like that into communities that need it the most. Thanks. Um, I think we'll mix up the order for this one. Jane, I think we'll start with you um, and we'll sort of go to Ryan and then to Madison and Emily. Um, the, the proposed rule um, at the SEC would potentially cover lots of companies. Those companies are spread out across different sectors. 
Um, how would the SEC rule, as you understand it, or the proposed rule, as you understand it, affect different sectors differently? And are there potentially ways that the proposed rule could be crafted, kind of what you were saying in your presentation, uh, to help different sectors, to help sectors that might face higher burdens um, make the disclosures that are required, um, you know, more easily? Yeah. Um... For good reasons, there will be certain sectors which are more uh, where where scope three will be um, where it will be difficult not to say that you have to report on scope three, and there will be sectors where it is easier to say that that is not necessarily so. And one could consider if there should be a um, a slimmer version for the SMEs um, because it is a burden for, for really small companies to report on, on, uh, on, for instance, scope three, which might be difficult for them, whereas scope one and two do not necessarily have to be super complicated to do. So what could be helpful is to consider um, a minimum requirement. And then on top of that, when companies become larger and larger, they are to report on more. Um, that is one thing. But then also consider the, uh, the sectors like for instance, food and ag, especially the food part, they will probably need scope one and two from the ag, but not necessarily scope three. So, and, and the ag might be mom and pop companies. So it might be um, a different way of working with, with the data. Thanks. Ryan, Jane just mentioned the food. What about the ag? What about the agriculture sector? That's one that I'm, I'm reading a lot about. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really important point, and I do think the SEC is thinking about it. Um, and I, you know, there are certain uh, tranches set up in the in the proposed rule for um, different requirements and different timelines timelines for complying based off of company size. So I think the commission has has this top of mind. Agriculture is a really good example because um, the scope three conversation is kind of messy there, right? You know, for a lot of folks, depending on where you're at in this, the agriculture value chain, um, scope three might be where you, you get things like methane emissions from, from livestock, that might be where that's captured. Um, and that is one of the most significant contributors to, to global methane emissions. So clearly that's um, very important for us to understand the full um, GHG footprint of a, of a sector or, or a company's participation in a, in a value chain. So, um, the trouble there, though, is, you know, at the, the individual farm level, we don't want to be burdening small farmers, small individual independent ranchers, suppliers to big companies, no doubt, um, but themselves relatively small. We don't want to burden them with, um, you know, costly, you know, administrative work where they have to implement really difficult to um, manage systems that, um, are expensive that they have to train themselves and their employees on, you know, that's not what the SEC is looking to do. And I don't think that's what investors really want either. Um, the, the burden of compliance ultimately falls on those large scale uh, purchasers uh, from, from those suppliers. Um, you know, the, those, those, those individual farmers aren't of course gonna have to file directly with the SEC. Um, I think the fear is that they would feel pressure from their their large customers to start gathering some of that information, implement those systems, um, or else those large purchasers might take their business elsewhere. Um, I think that's a legitimate concern. And, and I think the SEC is doing some stuff to, to address that. Um, first of all, though, I would question whether the economics of that makes sense for a large customer, someone who is gonna have to report for the SEC. To me, it would make more sense for that company to invest in providing that that technology and those solutions to its suppliers rather than making these whole scale shifts in its supply chain just based off of that reason um, the other thing also is that for the large companies only it, you know based off of the proposed rule right only scope one and scope two are going to have to have um you know to are going to have to be attested um, so scope three is still going to be estimated and modeled to some degree um, to Madison's point, it would be really helpful for investors if that was done uh, with a transparent and kind of standardized framework. Um, but again, I think ultimately that shifts the burden more to the reporting company rather than those 
individual farmers and ranchers. So um, it's a complicated one in, in ag specifically, and I think this is true of a lot of different vertical supply chains, but um, I don't think it's one that the SEC has, has completely ignored. Thanks. We are close to at time, but Madison and Emily, I promised you an opportunity to respond. So if you have lightning round style responses to which sectors might be affected most, I'll be happy to hear from you. I guess I just wanted to say that I think ag is a good example of where there's been maybe too much focus on the scope emissions and not enough focus on physical risk. Like this summer, we saw entire herds of cattle just dying and there being like no way to process to dispose of the bodies and crop yields were down. I mean, internationally, crop yields were down like very severely. So, you know, that highlights a lot of different things. That's hard to predict, but it really raises questions of resilience. And how do you, that seems to be a thing that you measure in a different way through like governance mechanisms than you would through a pricing of risks. That's what I'll say, my rapid response. The only thing I would add is, you know, the apparel sector is notoriously, um, really takes a lot of water it emits a lot of greenhouse gas emissions so um i think that is a sector that we really need to keep an eye on um consumers wear clothes right and so um it's a global issue and it's really affecting the local communities um, but we also need to as ryan said invest in the suppliers that are the mom and pop shops that are offering these goods and services to these global corporations um have the global corporations really invest in them um, share best practices and be that steward uh, that we're all into talking about. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, thanks, Madison, Emily, Jane, and Ryan for being fabulous panelists for us today. I learned a ton. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this briefing uh, since we started working on it a couple months ago and uh, just really fascinating. Um, looking forward to seeing what the SEC does um, and uh, keeping up with that. So thanks very, very much for sharing your expertise uh and perspectives with our audience today we really really appreciate it i would also like to extend a uh, heartfelt thanks to representative Kasten and his excellent staff for making his participation possible today and thanks for him uh his leadership generally on climate issues and, and this issue in particular so we really appreciate that um like to also uh thank my colleagues dan o'brien omri emma allison anna savannah and molly for everything they did to pull the briefing off today um, I felt a little rusty, but they didn't, uh, and um, it was a, a great event, and we couldn't do it without them, of course. We also have three really cool fall interns, Alina, Shreya, and Nick, uh, and they help out behind the scenes as well, helping out with notes and live tweeting and questions and everything like that. So this was their first briefing. This is the first briefing of the fall semester, so uh, thanks very much to them. My colleague, Dan O'Brien, just put a slide up. Uh, this is a link to a survey. Uh, if our folks in our audience uh, have two minutes uh, and you'd be willing to share your feedback about today, um, if you had issues with the live cast, with the audio, with the video, uh, if you have ideas for future briefings, if you have just general feedback, we read every response. And so it really matters a lot to us when, when one of you in our audience takes time uh, to, uh, to share your, your comments with us about how things went today. Um, we will go ahead and conclude. Uh, we have a briefing next Wednesday. Uh, it's uh, Catalyzing Climate Action in K-12 Schools. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and then we will uh, be off for a week or so, and then it's right into COPtober. Uh, we're going to be looking at the sixth assessment report, nature-based climate solutions, loss and damage, and then the COP27, the negotiations, the process itself and what to expect. We're really, really excited about that. You can RSVP, sign up for our newsletter and more at www.esi.org. I wish everyone a great rest of your Tuesday. And uh, thanks again to our great panelists and to Representative Kasten for uh, uh, sharing all of your, your, your expertise and perspectives today. Thanks so much. <laughs>